Hello, welcome to Dark Side of the Library. My name is Carrie, and tonight I'm going to be showing you some of my current favorite summer reads. I have not read all these books yet. I tend to be a person who reads five or ten books at the same time. One in the car, a couple on my Kindle, one in my office, living room, backyard, bathroom, as you can imagine. Sorry for the TMI. Uh, we are going to look at some dark, bleak summer reads. I'm getting this chat started over in Amazon waiting for our friends over there to join us, and I'd love to hear from you and hear where you are watching from. So let's get started. I know you're going to ask me about this cute little house, but let's start off by talking about my camera, because people always ask. This is a Logitech 4K Brio. I am not broadcasting in 4K here on Amazon. We broadcast in 720, but I use it for my YouTube videos. It's an upgrade from my older Logitech that didn't handle light very well, so I feel like this is a lot better. As for my microphone, I'm using a USB Blue Yeti microphone. It is right here. You can't see it on camera, which means it's not actually close enough to my face, so I should talk a little louder. We also use it for podcasting, and it has a USB to plug directly into my computer and get power that way. Next up, I wanted to chat about this little house. Did it disappear from my carousel? Did it sell out? Oh, behind me is a library photography backdrop. I use the photography backdrop to hide the fact that I'm sitting in an office that used to be a nursery and it was Winnie the Pooh themed and so everything is blue and yellow. Not very dark. So I use this library backdrop. It is fabric, so it's easy to hang, but it does get a little bit wrinkled. I can see some wrinkles right there. No biggie. And I am excited to chat about these books, but I just wanted to mention this is the new 2022 Lee Max Spooky Town Witch's Cottage. I had to treat myself to it. It is currently $55 and it lights up. There's a little light bulb in it. I have it plugged into the wall behind my backdrop. And if it was dark in here, which I don't think I want to do, maybe later if you guys ask really nice, I'll turn the lights off and we'll check out how well, maybe, well, Damn, I'm scared to turn the lights off because I might not be able to turn them back on. So we'll just have to imagine that it's really dark in here and this is all lit up and cute. It is resin. It's heavy. It doesn't make any sounds or do any motions because usually those are the $150 Limax Spooky Town houses, not the $55 ones. I'm going to put it on my mantle at Christmas time. All right, we are here for the books. Let's start off with one I have not read yet because I just bought it. It is all over Book Talk and Bookstagram right now. Just Like Home by Sarah Gailey. Love the color cover. It's a little gross. The house is dripping blood and it's been uprooted or something. Now feel free to have a laugh at my nerdy glasses. They are readers. I'm not quite ready for regular glasses yet. I can see distance just fine. But I'm a goth granny and I need them for reading. So, Just Like Home is a darkly gothic thriller from nationally best-selling author Sarah Gailey. Perfect for fans of Netflix's The Haunting of Hill House, as well as HBO's true crime masterpiece I'll Be Gone in the Dark, which I've never heard of. Have you guys heard of that? I don't know. I'm quickly pulling a price tag off of this book because Amazon will not be happy to know I didn't buy it from them. I got it on sale. Okay. It is currently on sale on Amazon, 10% off. And I like hardbacks because they look so awesome on my bookshelves. So, come home. Vera's mother called and Vera obeyed. In spite of their long estrangement, in spite of the memories, she's come back to the home of a serial killer. Back to face the love she had for her father and the bodies he buried there. That explains why the cover is dripping blood. Ah! I might not be reading this one at night. I'm not sure. Coming home is hard enough for Vera. And to make things worse, she and her mother aren't alone. A parasitic artist has moved into the guest house out back. I hate when that happens. That's why I don't have a guest house in the back. And the artist is slowly stripping Vera's childhood for spare parts. He insists that he isn't the one leaving notes around the house in her father's handwriting, but who else could it possibly be? There are secrets yet undiscovered in the foundations of the notorious Crowder House. Vera must face them and find out for herself just how deep the rot goes. So that introduction makes this sound like a YA book, but it's technically not. It's for adults. Okay. Home is where the heart bleeds. 
Shall we read just the first page of this so we can get an idea of what it's like? Why don't we check it out? Uh, Tor is the publisher, Tom Doherty Associates book. Interesting dedication. Wow, it's pretty deep. Let's check it out. This is the story of monsters and what they do to those who love them, those who fear them, and those who are simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. Or, from a different perspective, those who are in the right place at the right time. Serendipity is just as cruel as it is kind. This book is dedicated to anyone who has ever loved a monster. Wow, that's a pretty interesting introduction. So they start right off, just like home. I'll read just a bit of the first page, just to give you an idea what the writing style is like. And welcome, for those of you just joining us here at Dark Side of the Library, checking out our summer reads. The Crowder House clung to the soil the way damp air clings to hot skin. Vera had anticipated that coming back to her childhood home would be difficult. She had almost refused, had almost made up an excuse. I'm really busy at work. I don't have time to come watch you die. She shielded her eyes with one flat hand, trying to dampen the too bright day enough to make eye contact with the windows of her parents' old bedroom. There was only so long she could wait. There was only so long her mother would wait. Vera stood with one foot on the lawn and one foot on the driveway, sweating, straining as if she might be able to make out the sound of Daphne dying inside. But the house was built to keep the wind out and the sound in. It stood there, patiently waiting for Vera to come inside, and it did not reveal a single one of its secrets, no matter how long and hard Vera stared at it. That is the first page of Just Like Home by Sarah Gailey. This is all over YouTube, all over TikTok, uh, Bookstagram, BookTok, etc. So I grabbed it. I was tempted. The next book I wanted to chat about is at the beginning of our carousel down below or on the side if you're watching on your phone or certain desktops. Here's another book that everyone is talking about right now majorly. I have not read it yet. I haven't even started. It sounds so creepy. Hide. My camera is struggling to focus on it. So, Hide. Check out the beautiful end papers. I did not write this. It came printed that way, you guys. <laughs> it's an amuse. Oh, amazement park. Sorry. Get lost in the fun. So, a high stakes hide and seek competition turns deadly in this dark supernatural thriller from New York Times bestselling author Kirsten White. The challenge spend a week hiding in an abandoned amusement park and don't get caught. The prize? Enough money to change everything. Even though everyone is desperate to win, to seize a dream future or escape a haunting past, Mac is sure she can beat her competitors. All she has to do is hide, and she's an expert at that. It's the reason she's alive, and her family isn't. But as the people around her begin disappearing one by one, Mac realizes that this competition is even more sinister than she imagined and that together might be the only way to survive. 14 competitors, seven days, everywhere to hide, but nowhere to run. Come out, come out, wherever you are. This is Hide by Kirsten White. Everybody on Bookstagram is talking about this. All of my book podcasts, even the ones that don't cover dark books, they've been reading it and loving it. It's been pushing a little, like... Normal people's boundaries, normal podcasters that like chick lit and they like good deep book clubby books have been reading this and going, wow, I really had to push myself, but I'm glad I did. So let's read the first page. Hide. The Amazement Park opened in 1953. Get lost in the fun, posters advertised, and it was true. Crowds surged through the gates in the morning and didn't stumble out again until the sun had set and spotlights at the exit guided them free. The maps were useless. The you are here guides impossible to find. It was a park designed to swallow. Trees loomed over lush grounds. Signature topiary lined every walled and wandering path, adding to the sense of wonder. 
Roller coasters, swings, carousels, games, houses of love and fun and terror. Though the house at the very center was always closed for a refurbishment. The park was open from mid-May to mid-September. White's only was on signs in the early years, heavily implied when such a thing became harder to officially declare. And for one week every seven years, it was free. The gates would swing wide, and the summer migrant workers and distant relatives of the wealthy townsfolk, normally too poor to enjoy something designed purely for escape, would wander in, wide-eyed. There were no ticket sales, no attendance numbers, just a joyfully packed park. Now, in 1974, during the free week, a prominent businessman from upstate decided to visit. He hadn't been invited, but he was considering investing since a cousin of a cousin owned the park. He wanted to see the attractions for himself first, though. He brought along his wife and two children and made it a holiday. Their little girl, five, was never seen again. That is the first page of Hyde. Ooh, I can't wait to find out what happens. Ah! Okay. Next up, this is the book I am currently reading and thoroughly enjoying. Is it dark and creepy? No, it is not. It doesn't even have a dark and creepy color cover. This is the most book clubby book that I'm going to talk about tonight. It is presenting so many opportunities to chat and come up with things to talk about and discuss and what ifs and would you and what would you do, etc. Oh my gosh, it is the measure. And I'll read the summary of it, but I'm going to sum up so far with no spoilers what I found out so far. So the world is going on as it does. And one day, everybody in the world who's 22 years old or older wakes up and there's a mahogany looking box on their doorstep with their name on it. And they open it, most people, some people choose not to, and inside is a string. Huh. And you start comparing with your neighbors and the strings are different lengths. Every person's strings, short or long or in the middle or whatever. And everyone's wondering what the heck, and it's on the news, and everyone all over the world, even people living in tents in Mongolia, and people in the middle of the Amazon have it outside of their whatever, and it's outside of yurts, and oh my gosh. And then every morning, about 100,000 people all over the world that wake up and turn 22 get a box on their doorstep too. And so the scientists start studying the boxes, and they're indestructible. And they start studying the strings, trying to cut them, and they can't. And the box says, this is the measure of your life. And so it changes the entire world. And some people that have a short string, they start figuring out it means you're going to die soon. So they just leave their jobs and start parachuting and hang gliding and all that. But then the people with the long string are like, well, I obviously don't die from parachuting or taking risks. I want to take some more. So it's an interesting way that it, that it affects society. And this is a great book club read because you're going to have so much to talk about. I'm only in about this far in, and I'm, I can't say it's a page turner. I'm not like, oh, what happens next? But I'm definitely curious, like, you, you get attached to the characters already. What's happening? Some of them have short strings, some don't. And you wonder, where the hell did the boxes come from? Is it aliens? What's happening? I don't know. So let me read you what it says, because my summary of this was a little disjointed. This is the measure. It seems like any other day. You wake up pour a cup of coffee and head out. But today, when you open your front door, waiting for you is a small wooden box. This box holds your fate, the exact number of years you will live. From suburban doorsteps to desert tents, every person on every continent receives the same box. In an instant, the world is thrust into a collective frenzy. Where did these boxes come from? What do they mean? Is there truth to what they promise? As society comes together and pulls apart, everyone faces the same shocking choice. Do they wish to know how long they'll live? And if so, what will they do with the knowledge? The measure charts the dawn of this new world through an unforgettable cast of characters whose decisions and fates interweave with one another. Best friends whose dreams are forever intertwined, pen pals finding refuge in the unknown, a couple who thought they didn't have to rush, a doctor who cannot save himself, and a politician whose box becomes the powder cake that ultimately changes everything. So this is The Measure. 
I'm about seven chapters in. Uh, let me read you the first page. I'm pretty sure the publisher won't freak out if I read one page out of the book. It was difficult to imagine a time before them, a world in which they hadn't come. But when they first appeared in March, nobody had any idea what to do with them. These strange little boxes that came with the spring. Every other box at every stage in people's lives had a clear meaning, a set course of action. The shoe box holding a shiny new pair to be worn on the first day of school. The holiday present crowned with a looped red ribbon, skillfully curled on a scissor's edge. The tiny box with the long, dreamt-of diamond inside. And the large cardboard packages sealed with tape and labeled by hand, loaded into the back of the moving truck. Even that final box, resting under the earth, whose lid, once shut, would never be opened. Every other box felt familiar, understandable, expected even. Every other box had a purpose and a place fitting comfortably within the course of a typical life. But these boxes were different. They came at the start of the month, on an otherwise ordinary day under an otherwise ordinary moon, too early to blame the March equinox. And when the boxes came, they came for everyone all at once small wooden chests. At least they looked wooden. They'd emerged overnight, millions and millions of them in every town and every state and every country. The boxes appeared on finely mowed lawns in the suburbs, nestled between hedges and the first blooms of the hyacinth. They sat atop well-trampled doormats in the cities where decades of tenants had passed through the threshold. They sank into the warm sands outside tents in the desert and waited near lonely lakeside cabins gathering dew in the breeze off the water. In San Francisco and Sao Paulo, in Johannesburg and Jaipur, in the Andes and the Amazon, there wasn't anyone or anywhere that the boxes couldn't find. There was something both comforting and unsettling about the fact that every adult on earth suddenly seemed to be sharing the same surreal experience, the ubiquity of the boxes both a terror and a relief. Because in many ways, it was the same experience, in nearly every other manner, these boxes were identical. All were dark brown in color, with reddish tints, cool and smooth to the touch. And, inscribed on every box, was a simple yet cryptic message, written in the native tongue of its recipient. The measure of your life lies within. That is the first page of The Measure. This is the book I am most likely to finish tomorrow. I can't stay up that late or I would try and finish it tonight. Thoroughly enjoying it. There's no jump scares. It's not like, oh my god, who's going to die next? It's just really fascinating. I love the questions that it poses. I definitely recommend this for a book club that has a little more serious topic than just like chiclet, etc. That's the measure. Next up, let's chat about her Majesty's Royal Coven by Juno Dawson. I need to scrape a sticker off the cover. Hmm, that's what I get for buying it somewhere else. Okay. At the dawn of their adolescence, on the eve of the summer solstice, four young girls, Helena, Leonie, Niam, Neem, oh, I don't know how to say that name. Niam, Alp, and L took the oath to join Her Majesty's Royal Coven, established by Queen Elizabeth I as a covert government department. Now, decades later, the witch community is still reeling from a civil war, and Helena is the reigning high priestess of the organization. Yet Helena is only one, is the only one of her friend group still enmeshed in the stale bureaucracy of HMRC. Elle is trying to pretend she's a normal housewife and Niam, has become a country vet using her powers to heal sick animals. In what Helena perceives as the deepest betrayal, Leone has defected to start her own more inclusive and intersectional coven, Diaspora. And now Helena has a bigger problem. A young warlock of extraordinary capabilities has been captured by authorities and seems to threaten the very existence of HMRC. With conflicting beliefs over the best course of action, the four friends must decide where their loyalties lie, with preserving tradition or doing what is right. This is Her Majesty's Royal Coven 
by Juno Dawson. It is a novel. I thought it was a YA book. It, it is for adults, but I have to say I'm going to read it, but it does seem a little bit oriented towards teenagers. That's okay though. Read what you want to read. Here it is. It is book one in the HMRC trilogy. And it just sounded fun. It's a bit of a departure of the things I usually read. So I'm looking forward to it. Let's read the first page. Oh, and here's the quotes. Evil spirits observe silly young girls who are more given to curiosity and so more easily led astray by elderly workers of harmful magic. The Malleus Maleficarum, 1486. I agree with whoever said the Spice Girls are soft porn. They're the Antichrist. Tom York of Radiohead, 1997. <laughs> Her Majesty's Royal Coven. 25 years earlier. The night before the summer solstice, five girls hid in a treehouse. The shack, much too nice to call a shack, was sturdy enough, cradled in the arthritic branches of a 300-year-old oak. Below, in Vance Hall, preparations for tomorrow's festivities were finalized. It was more an excuse for the grown-ups to fetch up the dustier wines from the cellar two days in a row than it was a planning meeting. Their elders, quite some way past tipsy, truthfully hadn't noticed the girls were absent. Up in the tree, the youngest of the girls, Leonie, was upset because the eldest, Helena, said she couldn't marry Stephen Gately from Boyzone. I'm not playing, Leonie said. A congregation of candles burned in the treehouse window, wax trickling off the ledge into lumpy stalactites. Skittish amber light danced up the walls, casting campfire shadows across Leonie's face. Why does Elle always get to pick first? Elle's bottom lip quivered, her baby blue eyes filling with tears. Again. That was why Elle always got to pick first. She really could turn the waterworks off and on at will. I think they can both marry Stephen. Nam, Nam, Kelly said, ever the peacemaker. I'm going to look up how to pronounce that, that name. No, they can't, her twin sister said at the top of her voice. How's that going to work? Nam scowled at her. I don't think we're actually going to marry Boyzone. Do you, Clara? Ciara? We're ten! Helena said with authority, when L is twenty, he'll be thirty, so that's okay. Leonie stood as if to leave the treehouse, her fists balled tight. Oh, if you're going to storm off like a kid, fine, said Helena. You can both have Stephen. Poor Keith. Leonie nudged the trapdoor with her toe. It's not even that, Helena. It's just a game. It's stupid. Anyway, I said I'm going to marry the Fresh Prince, so it doesn't even matter. There was a moment of hush because they all knew what was really troubling her, for it troubled them all. The candles sputtered and there was a drunken hoot of dull laughter from inside the house. I don't want to do tomorrow, Leonie said, what she meant at last. She returned to the carpet and sat cross-legged. My dad don't want me to do it. He says it's evil. That is the beginning of Her Majesty's Royal Coven. It is a YA book. Adults are reading it too. I'm hearing a lot about it all over Bookstagram. Let's move on to our next book, which is... <gasps> I'm dying to start reading it, but I'm going to finish the measure first. It is When Women Were Dragons. It is currently 45% off. It is 1539. Let me grab it without upsetting all my other ah! books. Okay. This one is whew, very speculative fantasy. It's going to be very interesting. It's by Kelly Barnhill. Oh my gosh. When Women Were Dragons. Okay, this one sounds cool. You're going to see in a second why I bought this, right? Alex Green is a young girl in a world much like ours, except for its most seminal event, the mass dragoning of 1955, when hundreds of thousands of ordinary wives and mothers sprouted wings, scales, and talons, left a trail of fiery destruction in their paths and took to the skies. Was it their choice? What will become of those left behind? Why did Alex's beloved Aunt Marla transform, but Alex's mother did not? No one knows, and it's taboo to speak of it. Forced into silence, Alex nevertheless must face the consequences of this astonishing event. A mother more protective than ever, an absentee father, 
their upsetting insistence that her aunt never even existed, and watching her beloved cousin Beatrice become dangerously obsessed with the forbidden. In this timeless and timely speculative novel, award-winning author Kelly Barnhill boldly explores rage, memory, and the tyranny of forced limitations. When Women Were Dragons exposes a world that wants to keep women small, their lives and their prospects, and examines what happens when they rise en masse and take up the space they deserve. So let's read the first page of When Women Were Dragons from Doubleday, New York. The other books she wrote are Dreadful Young Ladies and Other Stories, The Girl Who Drank the Moon, The Witch's Boy, and Iron Hearted Violet. Mm. She dedicates this to Christine Blasey Ford, whose testimony triggered this narrative, and for my children, dragons all. That gave me goosebumps. When Women Were Dragons, being the truthful accounting of the life of Alex Green, physicist, professor, activist, still human, a memoir of sorts. Greetings, Mother. I do not have much time. This change, this wondrous, wondrous change, is at this very moment upon me. I could not stop it if I tried, and I have no interest in trying. It is not from any place of sorrow that I write these words. There is no room for sorrow in a heart full of fire. You will tell people that you did not raise me to be an angry woman, and that statement will be correct. I was never allowed to be angry, was I? My ability to discover and understand the power of my own raging was a thing denied to me until at last I learned to stop denying myself. You told me on my wedding day that I was marrying a hard man whom I shall have the pleasure to sweeten. It is a good woman, you said, who brings out the goodness in a man. That lie became evident on our first night together. My husband was not a good man, and nothing ever would have made him so. I married a man who was petulant, volatile, weak-willed, and morally vile. You knew this and yet you whispered matronly secrets into my ear and told me that the pain would be worth the babies that I would bring to you one day. But there were no babies, were there? My husband's beating saw to that, and now I shall see to him tooth and claw. The downtrodden becomes the bearer of a heavenly righteous flame. That is most of the first page of When Women Were Dragons, speculative fantasy, speculative fiction, set beginning in 1955 during the mass dragoning. Interesting! I have not read a book like that before. I'm intrigued, I have to admit. I'm going to start a pile of the books I've already talked about. I just grabbed The Ballad of Perilous Graves. It's also a book I don't normally read things like this, but I was very intrigued, and today it is 50% off. Hello, thank you. Sounds good. It is a very large book. That's going to be a lot of reading. It is by Alex Jennings. Let's see how many pages it is. Beautiful end papers, by the way. It is 453 pages. Okay. So I want to show you why I grabbed this, why I bought it. Oh, it starts off nicely. Okay. Nola is a city full of wonders, an alternate New Orleans made of music and magic. It's a place of sky trolleys and dead cabs where haints dance the night away and wise women help keep the order. To those from away, Nola might seem strange, but to perilous graves it's simply home. In a world of everyday miracles, Perry might not have a talent for magic, but he does know Nola's rhythm as innately as his own heartbeat. So when the city's great magician starts appearing in odd places and essential songs are forgotten, Perry realizes trouble is afoot. Nine songs of power have escaped from the piano that maintains the city's beat, and without them, Nola will fail. Unwilling to watch his home be destroyed, Perry will sacrifice everything to save it. But a storm is brewing, and the haint of all haints is awake. Nola's time might be coming to an end. Interesting. I have not read... Hi, Rome! Rome knows tech! Rome Wilkerson is in the house! Hello, lady. How are you tonight? Have a great stream. Thank you, Rome. I'm looking forward to going to bed with a cup of tea and one of these books and reading till about midnight, which is three and a half hours from now. Woo, I'm going to finish a whole book. I read fast. 
So this is the Ballad of Perilous Graves. And I have not read very many books like this at all. Let's read, well, let's read about the author for one thing. I don't know who this is. Alex Jennings was born in Germany and raised in Gaborone, Botswana. Paramaribo, Suriname, Tunis, Tunisia, and Columbia, Maryland, USA. His writing has appeared in Strange Horizons, Podcastle, and Uncanny Magazine, and he's a regular contributor to my favorite magazine, the Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction. He received the inaugural Imagination Unbound Fellowship at Under the Volcano in 2022. He lives and writes in New Orleans with his dog, whose name is Karate Valentino. <laughs> okay. Let's check out the first page of this book. Let's see what it looks like. Beautiful end papers showing the map of Nola as according to this world where piano magic is magic. Chapter one. Here I'm is. Perry Graves tried not to think about summer's arrival. The heat devils hovering breathless over the blacktop as if waiting for something to happen or even about the city streets. Tomorrow was the last day of school, and he'd be free to roam the neighborhood soon enough. But it wouldn't be soon enough. Perry and his little sister, Brendy, sat cross-legged on the living room floor watching Morgus the Magnificent on the TV. The unkempt, hollow-eyed scientist was trying to convince a gray-haired opera singer to stick his head into a machine that would allow Morgus to amputate the singer's voice with a flip of the switch. From here, Perry could hear his parents and their friends gabbing on the front porch as they sipped sweet tea and played dominoes. Why you ain't laughing, Brendy said. Don't talk like that, Perry said. Daddy hears you, he'll get you good. Then, I don't always have to laugh just because something's funny. Oh, I know, Perry, Barry, Derry, Larry. Brendy stuck her tongue out at him. You in a mood because you ain't seen peaches in a week. You don't want me talking like her because it reminds you of the pain in your heart. Perry scowled. Shut up. I'm sorry, Brendy said. I'm sorry you loves peaches like she your wife. Little bit, you be sorry you don't shut your mouth, Perry threatened. He had no idea what he could do to silence her without getting into trouble. Meow, rack. For a moment, Brandy absently imitated the sound effects for Morgus. You just want her to say, oh, perilous, I loves you too. Kiss me. Perry, like they do in... Perry was ready to grab his baby sister, clap his hand over her mouth at least, but before he could, a clamor rose up outside. Look at there, some grown-up shouted from the porch, his voice marbling through a hubbub of startled adult exclamations. Whatever was going on out there had nothing to do with Perry, so he ignored it. He was sure that someone had just walked through some graffiti or a parade of paint bodies was making its way down Jackson Avenue. He grabbed Brandy's wrist, all set to give her a good tickle, but when the first piano chord sounded on the night air, Perry's body took notice. Perry let go of his sister, and his legs unfolded him to standing. By the time the second bar began, his knees had begun to flex. He danced in place for a moment before he realized what was happening, then turned and made for the front door. That is the first page and a half of The Ballad of Perilous Graves by Alex Jennings. I'm very intrigued. Next up. Wow. I'm almost not mentally prepared to talk about this one. Wow. Whew. Ordinary Monsters by J.M. Myro. Tons of people on Bookstagram are talking about this, especially dark Bookstagram. Ordinary Monsters is a novel by J.M. Myro. It is huge. It is massive. Uh, it's going to take me a week or two to read it. And I'm an avid reader and a fast reader, but I'm also a busy person who works constantly. It's 660 pages. So it reminds me of Game of Thrones novels, which are usually six or seven or 800 pages or 900. Ordinary Monsters. So I'm going to read the flyleaf so you know why I bought this. It's a stunning new work of historical fantasy. It introduces readers to the dark labyrinthine world of the talents. England, 1882. In Victorian London, two children with mysterious powers are hunted by a figure of darkness, a man made of smoke. 
16-year-old Charlie Ovid, despite a brutal childhood in Mississippi, doesn't have a scar on him. His body heals itself, whether he wants it to or not. Marlo, a foundling from a railway freight car, shines with a strange bluish light. He can melt or mend flesh. When a jaded female detective is recruited to escort them to safety, all three begin a journey into the nature of difference and belonging and the shadowy edges of the monstrous. What follows is a story of wonder and betrayal from the gaslit streets of London and the wooden theaters of Meiji era Tokyo to an eerie estate outside Edinburgh, where other children with gifts, the talents, have been gathered. There, the world of the dead and the world of the living threaten to collide. And, as secrets within the Institute unfurl, Marlowe, Charlie, and the rest of the talents will discover the truth about their abilities and the nature of what is stalking them, that the worst monsters sometimes come bearing the sweetest gifts. Let's read the first page of Ordinary Monsters and see what it is about. Ooh, if I can hold it up, it's very heavy. Okay. The quote that begins this book is, And when men could no longer sustain them, the giants turned against them and devoured mankind. The Book of Enoch. The first chapter is called The Thing on the Cobblestone Stair, 1874. Lost Children. The first time Eliza Gray laid eyes on the baby was at dusk in a slow-moving boxcar on a rain-swept stretch of the line three miles west of Barry St. Edmunds in Suffolk, England. She was 16 years old, unlettered, unworldly, with eyes dark as the rain, hungry because she had not eaten since the night before last, coatless and hatless because she'd fled in the dark without thinking where she could run to or what she might do next. Her throat still bore the marks of her employer's thumbs, her ribs the bruises from his boots. In her belly grew his baby, though she did not know it yet. She had left him for dead in his nightshirt with a hairpin standing out of his eye. Good girl. <clears throat> Sorry. She had been running ever since. When she came stumbling out of the trees and glimpsed across the darkening field the freight trains approach, she didn't think she could make it. But then somehow she was clambering the fence, somehow she was wading through the watery field, the freezing rain cutting sidelong into her, and then the greasy mud of the embankment was heavy and smearing her skirts as she fell, and slid back and frantically clawed her way forward again. That is the beginning of Ordinary Monsters, a massive novel. Great for book clubs, although your book club might have to take an extra month for everyone to finish reading it. I have a feeling there's going to be a lot to talk about in this book. I'm going to set it back here. We have about five more books to chat about. Oh, I'm so excited about this one. I think I just got it yesterday. This is Into the Mist by PC Cast. I'll give you a second to check out this amazing cover. Gorgeous. It is currently 20% off here on Amazon. It's $19.99 instead of the usual $24.99. This, oh my goodness. As men fall to the mist, the age of womankind begins to rise. Hmm. So this is a post-apocalyptic book, which I like. It is set in the Pacific Northwest. Hood River, Mount Hood, Timberline, Portland. I live up here in Seattle. Here's Salem. Interesting. Look out, ambush at 216, and meet Oxford are labeled specifically on this map. Okay, what is Into the Mist about? Let's check it out. The world as we know it ends when an attack on the U.S. unleashes bombs that deliver fire and biological destruction. So this is a cheerful read, right? Along with sonic detonations and devastating earthquakes, the bombs have also brought the green mist. If breathed in, it is deadly to all men, but alters the body chemistry of many women, imbuing them with superhuman abilities. 
A group of high school teachers heading home from a conference experiences firsthand the strength of these new powers. Mercury Rhodes is the warrior, possessing heightened physical powers. Stella Carver is the seer, with the sixth sense about the future. Imani Andrews is the watcher with a rare connection to the earth. Karen Gay is the priestess, demonstrating a special connection with spirits. And Gemma Jenkins is the healer, a 16-year-old student who joins the group after losing her parents. As they cross the Pacific Northwest, trying to find a safe place to ride out the apocalypse, the women soon learn they can't trust anyone. And with fresh danger around every corner, it will take all their powers to save themselves and possibly the world. Interesting. So this is ah, Into the Mist. I'd love to know why my nose never itches until I'm on camera. Another map. They really like their maps in this book. To Lola Palazzo, the Stella to my Mercury, the Thelma to my Louise. Let's go on holiday. Hello. Oh, we get a picture of Mercury Roads in this. Interesting. Don't usually have illustrations in adult books. Let's read the first page. Those of you just joining us, we're looking at Into the Mist. Holy bleep. <clears throat> Bright and cold is so confusing. Mercury Rhodes dug in her purse for her sunglasses, which she found predictably at the very bottom of the bag. She fished them out, frowning at the lint from balled up unused tissues that always lurked in her purse and blew across the lenses before she shoved them on her face. She was joined by her best friend, Stella Carver, who also predictably had her shades pur perched perfectly on her nose. Stella pulled up, pulled up the faux fur collar on her 1920s flapper-style car coat and took a sip of her mimosa. Oh, please, Acorn, we've been at Timberline for five days, and this is, what, your third conference here? Mercury raised a brow. Fourth, and don't call me Acorn. Fourth, whatever, you're not used to the bright mixed with cold yet? And by the by, I like your dad's nickname for you. And ten plus years of best friendship allows me acorn privileges. Fine, call me acorn. And no, I think it'll always be weird to me that I can get a sunburn and frostbite at the same time. More importantly, where'd you get the mimosa? Ram's Head Bar made me a to-go flute. Aren't they sweet? Stella tilted her mirrored sunglasses down. Her glacier blue eyes sparkled mischievously as she batted her eyelies, ah, pff, eyelashes in mock innocence. Mercury snorted. You're an Oklahoma public school teacher, so I know they're... Mercury air-quoted the word. Not being sweet because you're an over-tipper. You know, I always tip a solid 20%. Bad tippers have no soul. Stella's full lips curled up into a cat-licking cream grin. But there are more ways to show appreciation than with, than with money. So you hooked up with that infant last night? Stella clutched her fake pearls. Dusty is 30 and a half, an absolutely legal adult. You're 45 and a half. That's a 15 year difference. Stella shrugged. Numbers, mere numbers. This goes on and on and on, and I need to stop reading it because it's getting a little inappropriate, which is awesome. That is PC Cast Into the Mist. Doesn't start off very creepy, but we got to get to know the characters before all you-know-what hits the you-know-where, and the apocalypse happens. So I'm looking forward to reading this. Into the Mist. Next up, The Cherry Robbers. It's a little bit off the radar now. Last The last two months, everybody on Book Talk and Bookstagram was talking about this. Isn't it funny that we don't have a book is on? <laughs> The Cherry Robbers by Sarai Walker. I have not read this one yet. It should have been the first day of the rest of their lives. Instead, it was the last. Iris Chapel and her five elegant sisters, all of them heiresses to the Chapel firearms fortune, live cloistered in a lavish Victorian mansion, neglected by both a distant workaholic father and a mentally troubled mother, who believes their home is haunted by the victims of chapel weapons. The sisters have grown up with only each other for company. They long to escape the eerie fairy tale of their childhood and move forward into the modern world, but for young women in 1950s Connecticut, the only way out is through marriage. 
Yet it soon becomes clear that for the chapel sisters, marriage equals death. When the eldest sister walks down the aisle, tragedy strikes. The bride dies mysteriously the very next day, leaving her family in the town in shock. But this is just the beginning of a chain of disasters that will make each woman wonder whether true love will kill her too. Only Iris, the second youngest, finds a way to escape. But can she outrun the family curse forever? Let's read the first page of The Cherry Robbers to get an idea and a feel for the author's writing style. The quote that begins the book is, Hell must break before I am lost. Before I am lost, hell must open like a red rose for the dead to pass. From Eurydice. So contents, the chapel family tree, the violet notebook, the Blue Diary, Volume 1, Bellflower, The Headless Bride, The Blue Diary, Volume 2, Aster, The Haunted Mother, Rosalind, Calla, and Daphne, The Blue Diary, Volume 3, Corpse Flower, Son of a Gun, Lady Don't Leave Me, Night Blooming Iris, and finally The Violet Notebook. So here's the Chapel family. Belinda and Henry made Aster, Rosalind, Calla, Daphne, Iris, and Hazel, Zelly Chapel. The Violet Notebook. August 3, 2017. Abiquiu, New Mexico. When Lola went to San Francisco last year, she bought me what she thought was a sketchbook, one small enough for me to slip in my pocket and take on my early evening walks through the hills surrounding the village. When I might see hollyhocks, I want to draw, or a desert cottontail, or any number of things. I never know where my walks will take me or what I will see. The destination isn't what it's important, but the light, best in late afternoon. Artists chase the light. The book is bound in faux leather and dyed a brilliant shade of bright blue, almost turquoise. One of the reasons Lola chose it for me. It was gray and gloomy the whole time she was in San Francisco, and when she saw the blue, it reminded her of the sky at home. And the sky reminds her of me. Lola once described our life together like this. Picture taking off in an airplane from a city where the weather is too bleak to bear. The airplane climbs and climbs and finally breaks through the clouds where there's nothing but light and blue sky. That's my life with Sylvia, she said. That's how it feels and that's how it looks. At an elevation of more than 6,000 feet, the sky here is somehow bluer than the sea. Lola always brings me gifts when she travels. It's part of our ritual, our little courtship dating back decades. She sometimes travels for work, taking a couple of big trips a year. I stay home, interested in only what's around me. The world to me is not out there. But Lola, like most people, doesn't see it that way. She ventures out, then returns home with small tokens to let me know she'd been thinking of me while she was away. I loved the blue book as soon as she handed it to me. I could imagine her buying it in a bookstore on one of those vertiginous San Francisco streets. She, in a simple skirt and sweater set, silver black hair pulled back into a low knot, a simple chain around her neck. No lipstick, never anything like that. Lola doesn't need adornment. The blue book was wrapped in plastic, and when I opened it the next morning after Lola had gone to her study, I discovered it wasn't a sketchbook, but a diary with lined pages. I decided not to tell Lola about the mistake she'd made, that I hated those lines that looked like bars on a cage. I see in flashes and impressions color and light, not in words snaking across and down a page, that deep cavern of writing which I rarely choose to enter. I put the diary on a bookcase in my study and hoped Lola wouldn't mention it again, never suspecting that one day I would need to write in it with a sense of urgency. That's The Cherry Robbers by Sarai, Sarai Walker. The next book is not for everybody. Trigger warning, it's The Violence, a novel. It is currently just $11.99, but that could be for the Kindle version. I'm not sure. It is by Delilah S. Dawson. I realize I have a bunch of women empowering novels tonight where women are getting very angry. <laughs> I'm not an angry person. I just picked these books because they looked very interesting. So, this book, The Violence, is about 
three generations of abused women must navigate their chilling new reality as a mysterious epidemic of violence sweeps the nation in this compelling novel of self-discovery, legacy, and hope. When Chelsea Martin kisses her husband hello at the door of their perfect home, a chilled bottle of beer in the hand and dinner on the table, she may look like the ideal wife, mother, and homemaker, but in fact she's following an unwritten rule book, carefully navigating David's stormy moods and a desperate nightly bid to avoid catastrophe. If family time doesn't go exactly the way David wants, bad things happen to Chelsea and to the couple's 17-year-old daughter, Ella. Cut off from all support, controlled and manipulated for years, Chelsea has no resources and no one to turn to. Her wealthy, narcissistic mother, Patricia, would rather focus on the dust on her chandelier than acknowledge Chelsea's bruises. After all, Patricia's life looks perfect on the surface, too. But the facade crumbles when a mysterious condition overtakes the nation. Known as the violence, it causes the infected to experience sudden, explosive bursts of animalistic rage and attack anyone in their path. The ensuing chaos brings opportunity for Chelsea and inspires a plan to liberate herself and her family once and for all. Let's check out the first page of this book. It's by Del Rey. It is dedicated to the survivors. I used to blame myself for not doing more, for not leaving earlier, for not pushing back, for not fighting him. Now I am kinder to the younger version of me. Now I believe that survival is enough. Author's note. The violence deals with themes of physical, emotional, and sexual abuse and includes animal death and graphic violence. Some of these scenes may be distressing for some readers. Writing this book and examining these themes has been part of my own healing journey. And she writes about how her relationship with her father was complicated and she and her mother left and she saw a therapist. And the book begins. The first recorded incidents of the violence occurred at Ruth Belmont of Land of Lakes, Florida was putting a tub of mayonnaise in her cart at a warehouse store on Tuesday, April 15, 2025. The peaceful and highly religious grandmother dropped the mayonnaise, reached for a large bottle of Thousand Island dressing, and struck a fellow customer, 24-year-old Melissa Mendoza. Mendoza's toddler sat in the seat of her buggy and watched silently as the elderly woman beat her mother to death with a bottle of dressing. Once Mendoza was dead, Belmont replaced the dressing on the shelf, selected a new bottle, and attempted to continue shopping. As local law enforcement tackled her to the ground, Belmont screamed, cried, and claimed innocence. Store cameras captured the grisly scene. When the violence was discovered to be a disease, Belmont was released from jail. She is now suing the state for $1.3 million in damages, including a broken collarbone. Later sufferers were not so lucky. That is the first page of The Violence by Delilah S. Dawson. This is going to be a read for everybody, but I'm looking forward to checking it out, and I'm wondering why it is so many pages. It's huge. 490-something pages. That's giant. Wow. We have just a couple books left to chat about tonight. Child Zero, a novel, is currently 50% off. It is $13.99 here on Amazon. It's by Chris Holm. And I picked this one up because it sounded really interesting. It began four years ago with a worldwide uptick of bacterial infections. Meningitis in Frankfurt, cholera in Johannesburg, tuberculosis in New Delhi. Although the outbreak spread aggressively and proved impervious to our drugs of last resort, public health officials initially dismissed them as unrelated. They were wrong. Antibiotic resistance soon roiled across the globe. Diseases long thought beaten came surging back. The death toll skyrocketed. Then New York City was ravaged by the most heinous act of bioterror the world had ever seen, perpetrated by a new brand of extremists bent on pushing humanity to extinction. Detective Jacob Gibson, who lost his wife in the 817 attack, is home caring for his sick daughter, when his partner summons him to a sprawling shantytown in Central Park, the apparent site of a mass murder. Gibson is startled to discover that, despite a life of abject squalor, the victims died in perfect health. 
and his only hope of finding answers is an 11-year-old boy who's on the run from some very dangerous men. Shall we read the first page of this book, too? Extinction is the rule. Survival is the exception, says Carl Sagan. Child Zero. Let's read the first page. Pike and his men reach the encampment's, excuse me, encampment's southwest gate at precisely 3.15 a.m. Twelve minutes earlier, their sleek black SUVs, three in total, armored, tinted, and stripped of emblems, license plates, and vins, entered the Lincoln Tunnel in Weehawken, New Jersey, having passed the darkened toll booths without slowing. Two minutes after that, they emerged from beneath the murky waters of the Hudson River in midtown Manhattan and zigzagged until they reached 8th Avenue. The stoplights blinked yellow in all directions. They encountered neither traffic nor pedestrians. Three years ago, Pike thought, these streets would have been bustling even at this time of night. Now, thanks to the citywide curfew, they were empty save for police cruisers and sanitization crews. The former rolled lazily through the intersections or idled nose to tail beside one another so that their drivers could converse. The latter clung to the sides of tanker trucks in hazmat suits. Or wandered two by two with smaller canisters strapped to their backs, spraying bus stops, subway stations, and other public spaces with disinfectant foam. Fresh from the nozzle, it was enough to make your eyes water, but within minutes it dissipated to a lacy film that turned to fine white dust when touched and smelled like some fragrance chemist's idea of clean. That is the first page of Child Zero, so that you could see the writer's writing style. It's a very intriguing book. Next up, also on sale, The Retreat. This is our final book tonight. We've chatted about all of the rest. This is by Sarah Pierce. They couldn't wait to stay here. An idyllic wellness retreat has opened on an island off the English coast promising rest and relaxation. But the island itself, known locally as Reaper's Rock, has a dark past. Once the playground of a serial killer, it's rumored to be cursed. But now they can't leave. A young woman is found dead below the yoga pavilion in what seems to be a tragic fall. But Detective Ellen Warner soon learned the victim wasn't a guest. She wasn't meant to be on the island at all and they would do anything to escape. The longer Ellen stays, the more secret she uncovers, and when someone else drowns in a diving incident, Ellen begins to suspect that there's nothing accidental about these deaths. But why would someone target the guests at this luxury resort? Ellen must find the killer before the island's history starts to repeat itself. Most came here to recharge and refresh, but someone's here for revenge. Okay, this is the retreat by Sarah Pierce. We're going to read the first page, and then we're going to chat for a second about this Limax Spooky Town Haunted Witch's Cottage. Okay, the quote that begins this book is, you can be a king or a street sweeper, but everyone dances with the Grim Reaper. Convicted murderer Robert Alton Harris's last words. The Retreat. Summer 2003. Prologue. Thea's scream rips through the clearing, startling the birds from the trees in a flurry of flapping wings. The sound isn't human. It's high-pitched and desperate. The kind of scream that turns your stomach inside out makes your ears burn. She should have waited until they got back to camp. He told her to wait. But Thea had insisted. Half an hour and three bears since they'd snuck away from camp for some time alone, and she couldn't hold it any longer. Don't look at me like that. It's your fault for bringing so many cans. Shout if you see someone coming. Laughing, she'd walked a few feet away, carefully positioned herself so Ollie could see only the sandy tips of her white kids, the thin trail of wet already winding through the dusty floor. The scream intensifies. Ollie freezes for a moment, but instinct kicks in. He lurches into action, pivoting toward her. But almost instantly, he comes to a halt a cloud of dried soil and leaves kicking into th the air. A movement, someone stepping out from the tangle of branches. The rock on the cliff above, the island's namesake, is casting them in shadow, 
but Ollie can see right away that this person isn't from camp. They aren't in shorts and a t-shirt like the kids, or the cherry green of the camp leaders. They're wearing something dark and shapeless. Ollie's eyes dart to Thea. He can now see her frantically thrashing in the dense underbrush. He wants to thank you for the follow, Brian. We are reading the first page or so of The Retreat by Sarah Pierce. <clears throat> All he can do is stare. His heart is lunging in his chest, hard, knocking thuds against his ribs. A violent flurry of movement and then a sound. The sharp, liquid crack of something bursting and breaking. It's a sound he's never heard before. Ollie closes his eyes. He knows it's Thea, but in his head, he's turned her into something else. A puppet, a mannequin, anything but her. That is the beginning of The Retreat by Sarah Pierce. Woo, I don't think I'll watch this when I'm alone in the house. Ah! So that is our list of current, summer, bleak, dark, horrific, and gothic reads. I'm so glad I could share these with you tonight. I just wanted to circle back to this darling Lee Max Village collection, which is Cottage House. It's from the 2022 line. It is a little resin collectible village. It comes with a light bulb and a plug that I can turn on and off, and I'm going to turn it off for the night. But uh, all throughout the spooky season, I'm going to have it on my mantle above my fireplace, or perhaps on my dining table or coffee table. All right, I turned it off. Thank you for the follow again, Brian, and those of you that are watching this on the replay, we're going to be bringing you a lot, lot, lot of Halloween books and toys and games and trivia and horror and goth and all that stuff, especially all the way through the months of September and October. I hope to see you in the next live stream. Thanks for watching.